Hello and welcome to Psych Boost. In this video we're moving on to theories of romantic relationships. We'll start the section off by looking at a theory called social exchange theory. In this video as well we'll look at an adaption of social exchange theory called equity theory. So we do need to know how to define both of those terms. And some of the key ideas we'll be throwing around are the min-max principle, cost-benefit analysis, comparison level, comparison of alternatives, equality and over-benefits and under-benefits. So quite a lot of key terms in this video. We'll discuss some evaluative research and I'll give you a bunch of ways to extend an evaluation in an essay. So to start off, our key researchers in this area are Falibut and Kelly. What they suggested was an economic theory of romantic relationships. So this is a suggestion that we see our relationships similar to how a business will see a transaction. A business will carefully consider the costs and the benefits of doing business. And they'll only go ahead if they're going to be in profit. So if each romantic partner wants to maximise their rewards and minimise their profits, they're using what's called the min-max principle. So the theory goes, if both partners are looking for mutually beneficial profit results, then this will end up resulting in a successful relationship. And the rewards and costs are kind of obvious. Rewards include self-esteem, feeling good about yourself, having entertainment from the other person, maybe gaining financial security by being with a well-off partner, friendship or sex. Social exchange theory will suggest we're going to be more attracted to these people. Costs will include giving up your own time, maybe them causing you emotional instability, causing you stress, making you lose your financial security if you're having to pay for them, and opportunity cost if you're going out with that individual, then you're giving up going out with other individuals. So those people with high costs, social exchange theory would suggest will be less attracted to them. One way in which social exchange theory is quite flexible is it does adapt to the idea that people have different rewards and costs. Some people might see financial security as more important than others. Some people might see friendship as more important than others. Each individual consider the rewards and costs in their own situation, but it's ultimately going to come down to this calculation. Now, social exchange theory doesn't just suggest that it's only down to rewards and costs. Social exchange theory also accepts that we consider our relationships in comparison. So first of all, we compare our relationships to our own internal working model of how we feel that a relationship should be. This might be based on relationships we've seen with our parents, our friends' relationships, perhaps romantic relationships we've seen on TV. And these all come together to form what we feel a good relationship is. This comparison level that we have for a good relationship will change over the course of a lifetime as we go through different relationships. For example, if we have a particularly good relationship, that might rise our comparison level up. Or if we have a particularly bad relationship we get out of, we might leave that relationship with a low comparison level. Our comparison level as well is linked to our own feelings of self-worth. If we have low self-esteem, we might accept a lower standard of relationship than if we have high self-esteem. And one of the comparisons we compare with other alternatives available. So we might look at our own partner and look at them against other potential partners or potentially being alone and consider if that would be a higher profit. If a higher profit can be found with an alternative, social exchange theory suggests that the relationship will end. So let's evaluate social exchange theory. I'll mention this study twice. I'll mention it in the context of social exchange theory. And in the next video, I'll mention it in the context of investment theory, because this piece of research does provide evidence for both. So Rosbert used a longitudinal questionnaire study. They had 17 male, 17 female participants. One important point to make is these participants weren't going out with each other each of the males were going out with a different female, each of the females were going out with different males, none of the participants in this study were dating each other. They were all in heterosexual relationships, and over this time they repeatedly answer questionnaires that had questions on it that related to costs, rewards, investments, and comparisons with alternatives. At the end of the study, the findings were that the cost-benefit applied maybe less to the start of a relationship, but once the relationship started to develop, ideas behind costs and benefits became more important. Also, that costs and benefits were considered against potential alternatives. But interestingly enough, the alternatives became less attractive over time as commitment developed. What was also found that as, as satisfaction increased, so as a balance of rewards and losses shifted more towards profit, commitment increased. So what does this suggest? This suggests that people do really consider if they should end the relationship by assessing alternate options and also their overall profit, which is what social exchange theory predicts. A more recent study by Spreacher looked at 101 dating couples. 
Speecher found that the more alternatives there were available, the level of satisfaction decreased. Now this suggests one of two things, both really predicted by social exchange theory. So that people are more satisfied in relationships if there are no alternatives to compare against. Or when satisfied, people will tend not to look for alternatives. We might raise a criticism against these types of research though, arguing that they have low validity. Very few couples will intensively rate their own relationship, as required by Rosberg. We might consider rewards and costs, but this is more likely to be an unconscious process we go through. Only really explicitly thinking about rewards and costs when we're already dissatisfied in our relationship. Moving on to equity theory. So as I suggested at the start of the video, equity theory is a development of social exchange theory. It has all of the same initial assumptions, but Hatfield criticized social exchange theory as missing the key component of fairness or equality. So what do we mean by equality being important in relationship satisfaction? This just means that people would be more happy if they feel that the balance of rewards and costs between partners is similar and one partner isn't getting far more out of the relationship than the other one who might just be getting by. Or the concept that both partners are getting what they deserve out of the relationship. So the concept really is balance. Both partners have profit minus loss. And this should be the same even if they're different profits and losses. Perhaps a couple are perfectly fine if one partner doesn't really help out with the housework, but they're very good with the finances or the children. Or one partner might put a lot into the relationship and also get a lot out of it. And the other partner doesn't put much in, but also doesn't really get much out of it as well. In these scenarios, the relationship will be stable because the overall profit and loss for both partners is kind of the same. However, there is the scenario of over benefits and under benefits. So this theory argues that even if you're over benefiting, even if you're the partner who's getting more profit out of the relationship, you're not gonna be happy because you feel shame and pity towards the other person and that's gonna raise feelings of guilt inside you. Whereas if you're the partner who's under benefiting, if you're the partner who's not getting what you want out of the relationship, you can start feeling resentful and ultimately get angry towards this other partner for not pulling the weight. We could argue that conceptions about equality might change over time. In the beginning of a relationship when a physical attraction is very high, people might not really be concerned about whether they're getting out of the relationship as much as they're putting in. So it might be more valid to talk about this as a process that goes on during the maintenance of a relationship. That being said, Hatfield's suggesting that Maybe in the later stage of relationships, successful couples aren't those ones who keep score and check that things are perfectly equal. They just kind of get on with it. So what research is there on equity theory? Well, Ute and some colleagues in 1984 looked at equity in marriage. They used as standards in this area of psychology, a self-report method. This self-report was used on newly married couples and they'd been together for at least two years. The questionnaire would measure their perceived level of equality in the relationship and also measure their current relationship stability and any feelings of distress that they had. You can see on the right hand side, Utain's predicted relationship between commitment and equity. So you can see commitment would only be high for those people who feel treated with equity. Commitment should be least for those people who under benefited. Utain found that those partners who felt that they were treated with more equity thought the relationship was more stable overall and were also happier in it. Utain also found there were no sex differences in concern for equity. Both males and females thought it was important in a relationship. So this does suggest, as predicted by equity theory, feelings of equality are important in the overall stability of relationships. A major problem with this research though is it is correlational. So when we see correlational research, we might argue that rather than it being a lack of equality that then goes on to result in dissatisfaction in the relationship, it could just be the other way around. It could be that people feel dissatisfaction and then as you feel that dissatisfaction, you look around for justifications for why your relationship might be unequal. So some extra evaluations we could use to build our argument. First of all, social exchange theory or equity theory assumes that people are really logical in calculating relationship decisions. But really there are many, many very illogical relationships around that don't make any sense according to social exchange theory or equity theory. This could be, for example, people who are in very abusive relationships that don't have much affection. One advantage that social exchange theory and equity theory does have are they're both very flexible ideas. They adapt to what individuals think are costs and benefits or what's meant by equality. So it does describe a range of individual differences in relationships. We might also argue that as relationships enter maintenance, physical attraction is less important. 
Maybe it's then that social exchange theory and equity theory explains this part of relationships. If we're just talking about social exchange theory, we might suggest that it's too simplistic. Hatfield has a point that it doesn't consider the role of equality within a relationship. It assumes that as long as both partners are profiting from the relationship, it'll carry on. But if one partner does have far more profit than the other, the other one's very likely to become dissatisfied. Also, Rusbutt's extension to the theory that we'll come to in the next video will consider the investment size, rather than just the current costs and benefits. One final evaluation is it might be that social exchange theory is culturally biased. If we look at collectivist societies, individual satisfaction is less important, especially in relationships that are arranged. What might be more important in these societies is maybe avoiding shame rather than satisfaction. We could maybe adapt social exchange theory to the consideration that the families have in the profit and losses to the families when setting up these arranged marriages, when sometimes arguments around profit and loss might be more explicit than the considerations that Westerners have when setting up their own individual relationships. So I hope you enjoyed this Psychboos video. Please, if you haven't already, click subscribe. And if you enjoyed this video, give me a like. If you have any questions at all, pop them in the comment box and I'll try and get back to you. If you'd like the free resources that come with this course, I put the posters and some other things into this Dropbox link. Until the next video.